Grace and peace to you from our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, let us reflect on our Epistle lesson, Second Corinthians chapter twelve, for a moment. Um, well, it is hot today, so well, please just relax and let us enjoy. Please sit back and let us enjoy listening to the word of the Lord for a moment. Um, especially in the verse. Ten in our epistle lesson, St. Paul says, For when I am weak, then I am strong. So we are going to reflect especially on that. Um, let me begin with sharing my own personal story. So please excuse me uh, for sharing my personal story. A little over 30 years ago, uh, one day, uh, famous world boxing champion, Mr. Zhang, uh, who was also from my home city in Korea. He came to a certain boxing club for special seminar. So I was learning boxing for self-defense skills, so I was so excited to join the seminar because he was one of the top world champions who defended his championship over 15 times successfully. So I came to the boxing club for the special seminar to learn good tips for better skills. And um, he, I met him and I received his signatures on the books. And also I talked to him briefly and also he taught um, different students, including me. And um, I learned a lot of things from him because he was a famous world champion. And it was my honor to see him. But. Uh, one of his teachings was pretty hard for me to understand. He said that to have a very strong, powerful tail punch, you should relax your entire body completely. No stiffened muscles anywhere on your body. And also when you throw a punch from your waist to the shoulder, the entire arm, even your fist should be very relaxed and so, and just when the moment of impact, you should give a snap. And it will bring a lot of power for KO. But I couldn't understand it well, because naturally we think that for more power punch, wow, we should deliver very strong power from the shoulder, from the waist, all the way to the tip of the punch. But uh, he taught us very differently. We should be completely relaxed from the top of the head to the toes. And so very relaxed punch like that. And just to keep snap before the heat. So I couldn't understand properly. I scratched my head. But because he was a world famous champion, I trusted what he said. And then later on, I wanted to try that paradoxical teaching of him. So about in two weeks, I had a chance to do a sparring, and then during the sparring, I was I, I was waiting for a very fast straight punch from the opponent, and when he threw a straight punch, I just did a parry, and then throw a counter punch, but I really reminded that I should be very relaxed. I just tried to throw very relaxed punch and deep snap into his stomach. Uh, the side of the body. But very surprisingly, when the punch was uh, successfully delivered with a sound of poof, <gasps> and then he was just knocked over. And I, I, I was very surprised to see that because I didn't have really powerful punch. So I looked at my punch, and he was on the ground, and he couldn't get up right for a while. And I thought that, wow, his teaching was correct. His teaching was paradoxical, but it was the truth. If you want to have a KO punch, you should be really relaxed. You should relax your entire body and throw very relaxed punch, give a snap. <coughs> so that sounds very paradoxical, but it is the true teaching from the world famous champion. In our APIS lesson, we hear another paradox. St. Paul says, when we are weak, we 
we are strong. He says, when I am weak, then I am strong. It sounds very weird. It sounds strange. It sounds wrong. And also it sounds very paradoxical. But let's think about why. Why he says, when I am weak, I am strong. St. Paul speaks of a thorn in the flesh in our English lesson this morning. And even he calls it a messenger of Satan that had a purpose of torment. Many ex explanations have been put forward. But whether St. Paul is referring to physical, spiritual, or emotional affliction, So it has been never answered with satisfaction. Since he was not talking about a literal thorn, he must have been speaking metaphorically. Some of them, some of the more popular theories of the thorn's interpretation include temptation, a chronic eye problem, malaria, migraines, or epilepsy. But no one can say for sure what St. Paul's thorn in the flesh was. But it was a source of real pain in the apostle's life. St. Paul, however, clues us in concerning the thorn's purpose to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. So God's goal in allowing the thorn in the flesh was to keep Paul humble. Anyone who had encountered Jesus and was commissioned personally by him would, in his natural state, become puffed up. As to that, the fact that St. Paul was moved by the Holy Spirit to write much of the New Testament in the Bible, and it is easy to see how St. Paul could become haughty or excited about measure or top trump. No one likes life with a pain. Likewise, St. Paul also was seeking the Lord three times to remove this source of pain from his life. He probably had many good reasons why he should be pain-free. He could have more effective ministry. He could glorify God even more with that. But the Lord was more concerned with building St. Paul's character and preventing pride. Instead of removing the problem, whatever it was, God gave St. Paul more overwhelming grace and more compensating strength with which he could get it over. St. Paul learned that God's power is made perfect in weakness. St. Paul had a certain pain in his life but because of it, he could keep himself very humble before God, and he could keep himself very faithful to the Lord. It sounds paradoxical. But we can figure out why a little later on. While ministering as a pastor over a decade, I have served seven churches in Alberta in Saskatchewan and in British Columbia, including my own parishes and the neighboring vacant parishes as interim pastor. In one of my former places, there was a couple who looked very happy and successful because they were very active in the church and they had very good reputation in the community and they were very successful farmer, a very rich farmer, and his wife was a registered nurse, and they owned a beautiful, beautiful mansion on their farm, and also they owned a beautiful trailer, which was over $100,000 for camping, and also they owned a beautiful fishing boat, which is over $50,000, and also they owned beautiful cars and trucks. And also, they spend usually two months in the Caribbean or Arizona in the winter time. 
So I thought that they were very happy. But after a few times of, of the regular pastoral visitations, they began to talk about the difficulties of their lives, asking spiritual guides and constant prayer for them to get it over. Their problem was their eldest son, whose life was being destroyed by drug addiction and alcoholic, and also his son's wife's suicide. So that they had to take care of their eldest son's daughters. At first, I had thought that their lives were almost trouble free and very happy about life, but their hearts were aching and aching so much. While ministering over a decade, I learned that from young children to old people, almost everyone has issues in their life. Learning problems, learning disability, parenting problem, autism, Asperger's syndrome, drug addiction, alcoholic, totally broken relationship with their own children or parents or their own brothers and sisters, business issues, marriage issues, divorce issues, job issues, physical infirmities, incurable diseases, cancers, death of loving ones, financial and death issues, mental issues of oneself, or the family members, such as a severe depression, schizophrenia, <coughs> lack of self-esteem, sense of inferiority, deep hurt from the childhood, and it could go on and on and on. So I learned that externally, many people have a happy and very decent, comfortable life. But I learned that internally, most of people are struggling with issues, issues of their life. If you don't mind, let us sit back and let us now take a look at just for four minutes a short video clip to help you to understand these issues.
So what's God to do? I'm like, how do you mean by that? Can I even look at that? I don't know. I can't take this anymore. I can't get out of here. How is your life? 
Is your life almost a trouble free? When it's good, I'm glad to hear that. And please give thanks to the Lord for His wonderful blessings. If you have difficulties in your life, then please keep coming to the Lord for His grace. For non-believers, it is hard for them to find out any comfort and solution for the issues of the life so that they depend on drugs and alcohol, etc. to just escape from the reality of the life for a moment. But for believers, don't get too frustrated. Our Lord says, don't be afraid. I am with you always. When we come to Him, we receive His comfort, His strength, His wisdom, His power, His healing, and transformation of the life. Our weakness and the issues of the life lead us to God's grace, and His grace is sufficient for us so that we can get it over with the power and help of the Lord. And also our Lord changes the situation of our life in mysterious, mysterious ways through the constant prayers. When we are weak, we are strong. It sounds paradoxical, like the teaching of the world's famous champion. But when we are weak, we are strong, because we can come to the Lord for His help. May the Lord grant you His grace and His help on your humble coming and faithfulness to Him. Amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all your understanding, give your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ our Savior.